Well, good morning. For those of you watching online, no, I'm not Pastor Joe. Uh, even though I do have a scratchy voice most of the time anyhow, so I don't, I'm not buying that excuse. So for the people online, if you're sitting in your pajamas and you want to just go back to bed, I don't blame you, but uh, we're not the ones that are watching you on your phone. It's the communist Chinese and, and some people in our own rogue government that are watching you through your live stream device, whatever that is, a computer or cell phone or smart TV. Uh, boy, I don't want to get us kicked off the live stream already. Do We're only a minute in. Well, Pastor already beat me to a plug for our Wednesday night study. Great study through the book of Joel. And uh, we've got a lot of great studies here through the week. If you're not plugged in to a Bible study here at Calvary Chapel, please do so. Um, there's no excuse. You can make time. God will make time for you. Um, different times, different days that, uh, that can fit into your schedule. You've heard the saying that uh, going a whole week without being in God's work and fellowship can make one week. And that's true. We need to be refilled with the Spirit daily. We need to be in communion with one another, in fellowship, and in God's Word. So be sure that you're doing that. Uh, did anybody get an update on Jim Pheasant? I've been asking and I haven't heard. Let's be sure to pray for him as well at the end of our study. Um, well, we finished up the book of 2 Corinthians. Pastor's gone through uh, a series on Thanksgiving with us now the last, uh, last week. We'll continue that today. We have so much to be thankful for. I'm thankful for a lot of things. How about you? For sure, we're thankful for our recent election results. For Purdue, for Purdue fans, we can be thankful that basketball season is here. There is that other sport we won't mention, but congrats to the men's basketball team for beating number two Alabama on Friday. We can be thankful for our families. I'm sure Pastor and Peg have enjoyed their time with, uh, with grandkids, Caroline and Corbin, visiting with them for, for a better part of a week here. And yeah, Julie, it was nice enough for you to bring them up here and be the chauffeur and, and for Shiloh for taking them back because, uh, you know, one thing that Sarah and I have learned early on is that uh, grandparents are more interested in grandkids than they are the, the kids anymore. You're just the chauffeur. You're the mode of transportation to get them to and back. Uh, the other thing is I notice that grandkids get a lot of spoiling. I don't remember that as a kid. But grandkids sure get it. I get it. I do. And, uh, yeah, you can send those little ones back all loaded up with sugar and goodies and let their parents deal with them. We can be thankful for provision, for a roof over our head, food on the table. You know, millions go hungry around the globe. I'm thankful for my wife of 37 years. And for two boys. Yeah, you can applaud for that. <laughs> and for two boys that are falling hard after the Lord right where they're at. Um. This morning, I'm thankful that I get to preach. I'm thankful for all of you, my church family. So much to be thankful for. But this morning, I want to focus on to whom are we thankful? I've titled our message this morning, Thankful to Whom? You know, I found lots of cute memes of stuff that we can be thankful for. But when I searched for something that said, to whom are we thankful? It was pretty slim pickings. Maybe that's to be expected in our self-serving, self-indulgent, self-praising society today. Um, well, we're going to look at to whom we are thankful this morning. Before we get started, let's go ahead and bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Father, thank you for blessing us through your word and for allowing us to come together to freely assemble to worship. For that, we indeed are thankful. Father, help us to seek wisdom from you and to apply it to our lives in a, in a way that gives you honor and glory and praise for you alone are worthy. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Flip open to about the middle, and you're either going to be left or right of there just a little bit. Psalm 107. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version this morning. Psalm 107 begins book five of the Psalter. Uh, we don't know the author for sure. Some believe it may have been David. Other scholars suggest that this psalm was written much later than David possibly during the laying of the foundation of the second temple. Uh, the context is Israel's return from captivity in Babylon, but it looks forward to an even greater redemption, hope in the coming messianic kingdom. 
Psalm 107 is a psalm of praise to God, God the Redeemer. And after an introduction exhorting the redeemed to praise God for his goodness in verses 1 through 3, the writer brings together four different kinds of people whom the Lord has redeemed from adversity in verses 4 through 42. And it concludes with an invitation to discern God's unfailing love in all areas of life, verse 43. Now, I'm not going to do a verse-by-verse -verse study with you this morning. Instead, we're going to do a flyover, a summary study, hitting the high spots, but taking time to hone in on some specific verses for greater context. By now, you recognize that uh, I have you jumping all around in God's Word on Wednesday night, so this isn't going to be a whole lot different, but we'll have most of the, the verses up here on the screen for you. Uh, but we're going to mainly focus on Psalm 107, so keep your finger there. Psalm 107, verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. I think we just heard that. Isn't the Holy Spirit great? You ever notice how psalms and prayers often begin with thanks? I don't think that's by coincidence. Another translation reads, For His steadfast love endures forever. And before you think that I might be cherry-picking verses here, consider that Psalm 106.1 Psalm 118.1, Psalm 118.29, Psalm 136.3, and 1 Chronicles 16.34 are pretty much verbatim of Psalm 107.1. Paul takes it a step further in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything give thanks. How much is everything? Everything. That's a lot, right? No, it's more than a lot. It's everything, every single thing. See, we're to be thankful in all things, at all times, not just when things are going well for us. Now, what this verse does not mean, we don't pray, Lord, thank you for this illness, this disease, even cancer that I've got. Instead, we might pray something along these lines. Thank you, Lord, despite whatever ailments I have. Lord, you are sovereign. You are in control. This didn't catch you by surprise, and I'm leaving it in your more than capable hands. See, we can be thankful even during adverse conditions and times. Why? Because the God we serve is sovereign. That means overall. Nothing gets past our God. He never sleeps or slumbers. In other words, our God is large and in charge. When we as believers pray, rest assured that he's got this. We recently read in our study of 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul says that in his weakness he is made strong. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, it's not Paul's strength here. It's not his strength alone. It's Christ in him, the hope of glory. It's the Lord's strength that sustains us in our time of need. Getting back to Psalm 107, skip down with me to verse 8. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that men would give thanks. To whom? The Lord. Skip down to verse 15 with me. What's this? The same verse repeated. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And skip all the way down to verse 31. We'll look here three times. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Are you starting to see it? Do you see a pattern? It's the chorus of a song of praise and thanksgiving. To whom? To the Lord. The only one who is able to redeem them. But back up just a bit. There's another instance of this same chorus, verses 21 and 22. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. We've seen that verse several times. And in the words of that great philosopher and theologian, Ron Poe Peel, okay, maybe he wasn't either a philosopher or theologian, but he was one of the most popular late-night infomercial guys. He invented the uh, pocket fisherman, if you remember that. Two million of those little things sold. 
I don't know how many are still in use. Remember, Ron Popeil would say, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Following Psalm 107, verse 21, verse 22 says, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Sacrifices of thanksgiving and singing joyfully about all he has done. Time and time again throughout the history of the nation of Israel as described here in 107, the people cry out in their time of need, and the Lord delivers them from all of their distresses, even to the point of destruction, verses 19 and 20. Remember I said that this psalm addresses four different types of people whom the Lord has redeemed. Verses 4 through 9 are those who are lost, lost in the wilderness. The people thank God for his rescue. Much of his, Israel was lost in the wilderness of Babylonia during their exile and captivity. They were temporarily displaced from their land, similar to how they wandered through the desert all those years. I think you can make a parallel case that, like Israel, many of us were lost, wandering without direction before the Lord intervened and redeemed us. Or maybe you better equate to the fools in verses 17 through 22 who received what they deserved but were rescued from death and then offer thanksgiving. You know, the Lord has redeemed some of us out of certain death. Maybe that's what it took to get our attention. Verses 23 through 32 talks about a third people type, sailors. And beyond the literal meaning of actual sailors at seas, these are people who have lost their way. They've lost their bearings. They've lost all hope. And I'm sure many of you have felt this way a time or two. These sailors praise God when he saves them from all the chaos and the peril of the sea. Lord, help, they cried in verse 28. And just like Jesus, who awoke during the storm in Matthew 8, verse 26, the Lord calms the storm and the seas and the waves for the sailors here in Psalm 107, verse 29. I mean, sure he does. He's the same God, Old Testament, New Testament, yesterday, today, and forever. Our Lord is still in the business of calming waves and redeeming people. Amen? Amen? And the final category of people that God rescues is the farmers in verses 33 to 42. These farmers lost everything, their crops, their livestock, their way of making a living. Some of you can relate to losing your way of a living at one point or another. It's a sober reminder that we're completely dependent upon God, even for our current job and skill sets. Now, there's something to be thankful of that we probably don't remember to thank God enough for. We think of being thankful for our daily bread, His provision, sure. Realize that the skills that you have to do the job and the, and the talents that God's given you all came from God. Oh, sure, you may have gotten some training or or learned along the way, you maybe went to college and got a four-year degree. But God did that. And he's using that with you today. There's a lot in life that we have no control over. The farmer prepares his soil and plants a seed, but he can't make it rain. Only the Lord can do that. The farmer here in Indiana, anyhow, can pump the soil full of anhydrous to fertilize the plants but he can't make them grow. See, there's things out of our hands that we have to rely on God to take care of. Farmers, sailors, whether on land or sea, God has a plan for you and me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It's a joyous chorus that many of us here in the morning can relate to, amazing grace. Dropping down to the end of Psalm 107, the righteous recognize to whom they are thankful, verses 42 and 43. The righteous see it and rejoice, and all iniquity stops its mouth. Whoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. In the NLT, these verses read, the godly will see these things and be glad, while the wicked are struck silent. Those who are wise will take all this to heart. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. Their praise and thankfulness is directed toward the Lord. Yeah, Brian, but that was written to Israel. It sure is. It's also applicable to us today. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given 
by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. While it's true that some promises are given to Israel and Israel alone, much of the Bible, including the Old Testament, have application to us as well. Our founding fathers recognized that and used the Bible as sort of a cornerstone or the foundation of this great nation. Our founding fathers got a lot of things right. Our country would be in a lot better shape if we didn't try so hard to remove Christianity and the Bible from our nation's history. There are those on the left that work overtime to try to discredit our founders and paint them as deists or atheists. Like Israel in Psalm 107, historically our country has given thanks where thanks is due to the Lord. On October 3, 1789, the first president of the United States, George Washington, issued a national thanksgiving proclamation. It begins by saying, whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have, by their joint committee, requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer, to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. First of all, notice that Washington said it's the duty, the obligation of all nations to acknowledge or admit and concede the providence, that's the protected care, of Almighty God. You get the idea that Washington took God's providence very seriously. Our nation's first president, a man who helped fight to liberate our country from the authoritarian regime of the King of England. I'm sure there were plenty of people that old George could have pointed to, but he purposely points to God for the redemption of our nation. Washington mentions God twice in the first paragraph and a total of 15 times in his entire proclamation. And make no mistake, this is the God of the Bible, not Allah, not Buddha, not some other little G God. Keep trying, history revisionist. Secondly, Washington says we are to obey his will. Newsflash for you. We can't obey his will if we don't know what his will is. And we can't know what his will is unless we're in his word. Do you think we need to have the Bible back in our public schools? Yes. We recently hosted Gary Varvo as a talented Christian artist whose cartoons I regularly share with our Wednesday night study. His cartoons are amazing, but Gary's insight into politics and culture from a biblical worldview is even better. This cartoon depicts the pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock proclaiming to whom? To God. For a land where their children would be free to pray and read the Bible in school. Imagine their dismay if they only knew what the future held. I know, I know, public schools didn't come along until 1821. and uh, The Boston School of Latin uh, predates that by almost 200 years. By the way, the Bible and prayer were integral parts of public school until recently. All the way up until 1963. Some of you might remember having daily prayer in school, or even reading the Bible as part of your curriculum. Another cartoon drawing of Gary's. Uh, today, our public school teachers are handcuffed from even sharing their faith openly. I mean, how do you explain the origins of Thanksgiving without mentioning the God of the Bible? It's insane. But common sense and guidelines just may be making a comeback. I think God's given us a reprieve in this election. Several states are already pushing to get Bibles and prayer back into public schools. Some are even trying to get the Ten Commandments posted in their public schools. But it's not without a fight. Of course, the atheist left, controlled by Satan, wants nothing to do with having the truth of God's Word in the classrooms. Expensive lawsuits and tying up state and federal appeals courts for years on end seems to be the strategy most employed by those who hate God. Back to Washington's proclamation for Thanksgiving, which, by the way, is just another 
thing they can't teach properly in our nation's public classrooms without an acknowledgement of sovereign God. Third, after saying that we should obey God, Washington says that we should be grateful, thankful for his benefits. We don't use benefits quite the same way in today's vernacular. Um, this could be better rendered blessings, that we're thankful for his blessings today. Fourth, he says that we should be humbly to implore his protection and favor. Humility is another word our generation doesn't understand. And implore means to plead, beg, ask God for his protection and favor. In the third paragraph of Washington's proclamation, he does something that's unheard of today, but something that is desperately needed. He said, and also that we may then unite in most humbly offerings our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions. Repent. We have many national transgressions or sins. Because of that, we have a lot of beseeching or repenting to do today for disobeying God's will. We've aborted 65 million babies. We've redefined marriage and gender. We have record-setting crime, homicides, and immorality. Has President Biden or any president in our generation, for that matter, issued a proclamation repenting of our national sins? I don't know about you, but I'd be thankful that he'd been acknowledged in Almighty God our duty to obey him, and our thankfulness for his benefits. Instead, we've heard some of our past presidents go on and on about what they and big government can do for us. All these great government programs, they all come at taxpayer expense. They uh, somehow fail to mention that. Second Chronicles 7.14, many of you have this verse committed to memory. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Again, this verse is written to Israel, but we can clearly apply it to our nation today. We have a national day of prayer. One day, yet we have an entire month set aside to honor something that the Lord considers abominable. We call it Pride Month. Prayer and pride are two words within a page or two in the dictionary, yet they couldn't be further apart in God's economy. See, God values prayer. It honors him. We know what he thinks about pride. Proverbs 6.18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And I've used this quote from Ronald Reagan many times. Without God, there is no virtue because there's no prompting of the conscience Without God, we're mired in the material, that flat world that tells us only what, the sense, only what the senses perceive. Without God, there's a coarsening of the society. Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. President George Washington understood this. It's obvious from Washington and the Founders' writings that they sought the Creator God, and he answered by making the USA in many ways the greatest nation in history. So I have two questions for you this morning. Why were the Founding Fathers successful against all odds? Why is America struggling today with division, hatred, crime, astronomical debt? moral decay, and more. We need to look no further than our founding fathers. Here's their answer. They sought the creator God while our culture seeks big government. They sought uniting the nation, one nation under God. A nation in repentance looking to God for our redemption. Today, if we want our nation to be blessed, we must do what our founders did. Repent and seek his face. Give him thanks for it is due to him alone. Hey, we can praise God that Donald J. Trump was elected to be our 47th president. We'll certainly be blessed with more religious freedom and protections under the First Amendment than we had had the other candidate won. A threat to democracy, they said. 
I don't know about you, but I saw the shoe being on the other foot. Daniel 2 verse 21 says, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And Proverbs 29 2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. I shared this on Wednesday night. President Trump might not be righteous, but he's a whole lot closer to representing biblical values than his opponent. He's definitely not perfect. But then again, neither are we. You've heard it said that we should vote for the lesser of two evils. And I'd suggest that we, the people, voted for less evil. There was no perfect candidate on this ballot. Jesus was not on the ballot, but there was a Jezebel. That said, our trust should always be in God, not government. Today we can be thankful that God has shown us undeserved mercy and given us a reprieve in our country. And we can be thankful that it was a mostly peaceful election. Unlike the first time President Trump was elected, and we had all those mostly peaceful protests in our inner cities. Church, we need to be persistent in our prayers for our country and its leadership. While he may be elected, President Trump has not been sworn into office yet. There's still a lot that can happen between now and then. Two attempts on his life already, and who knows how many more were thwarted. Remember, we are to pray for those in office, and that includes safety for them and their family. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, Therefore I exert first of all that supplications, prayer, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful, peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And what? Giving of thanks be made for all men. God rewards us for diligent prayer for our leadership with quiet and peaceful lives. We can be thankful that we still have a free country where we can vote in new leadership, where we can meet and worship and pray, where we can have free speech to share the gospel freely to a dead and dying world around us that so desperately needs to hear the saving hope of Jesus Christ. In that alone, we can all be thankful that he bore our sins and shed his blood on the cross for sinners like you and me, that he died and rose on the third day conquering death, that he ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, awaiting the perfect time to return for his church before judgment on this earth has to happen. He could come back today, church. Are you with me? Are you ready? Praise God. Indeed, we have so much to be thankful for today. One last cartoon. The family, three generations here, is sitting around the table after just giving thanks for the Thanksgiving feast. And the little girl asked, why aren't we this thankful every day? Good question. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, are we expressing thanks to the Lord every day? Or just when mom spends a day and a half fixing a huge meal with a big turkey or ham? Why aren't we this thankful every day? And thankful to whom? I think these questions need to be reminded of. I know I certainly need a reminder from time to time just exactly who I'm thankful to. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. If you're in need of prayer or simply want to stand in for a friend or a family member who's in need of prayer, please come. Let's lift up your needs to our Father who loves us so much. He hears and answers our prayers. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for your love for your ancient people and for your church. Thank you for giving our nation this reprieve, as temporary as it may be, before your judgment comes against this sinful world. Father, help us to be the salt and the light that you've called each of us to be while we're still here. Help us to be bold in our witness and your testimony strong in our lives. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said,